Hello, everyone, and welcome to the SITREP Podcast, your forward operations space for all things military and historical wargaming. I am your host today, Ariskini Jim, and today we are using the Force on Force system by Ambush Alley Games and Osprey Publishing to mark the 30th anniversary of the Battle of Mogadishu. Now, as I'm sure most of our subscribers know, the Battle of Mogadishu took place in the capital of Somalia, beginning on the afternoon of October 3rd and lasting through the morning of October 4th, 1993. Of course, one of the reasons the Battle of Mogadishu has been so deeply branded into our collective memory is the film Black Hawk Down. The movie isn't bad, in fact, it's better than most when it comes to the details of the military history. But like with any movie, it's going to have to generalize and round things off and leave things out. That's just the nature of the beast. As it is with movies, so it is with war games. And in today's scenario, we are also going to be leaving some things out, changing a few things, generalizing a little. And of course, we're only trying to recreate a very small sliver of the overall Battle of Mogadishu. So the context and background very quickly. Somalia in the early 90s was in very bad shape. A combination of civil war, economic hardship, and horrific famine had combined into a self-perpetuating cycle of humanitarian disaster, which the international community was trying very, very hard to mitigate. Starting in 1992, we saw UNISOM-1, that's United Nations Operations in Somalia, followed quickly by Operation Restore Hope. This was largely an American effort protected by a force of U.S. Marines, followed very quickly by UNISOM-2. But honestly, none of these had made that big of a difference just against the sheer scale of the humanitarian disaster. But these were big multinational efforts that had cost not only the lives of dozens of American soldiers, but also Pakistanis, Malayans, Indians, Italians, Nigerians, Moroccans, and Belgians as well. And those were just the countries that actually lost soldiers. There were plenty of other nations providing support as well. The cause for all these casualties was one of the factions in the ongoing Somali Civil War. This was the SNA, or Somali National Alliance, under the command of Mohamed Farah Adib. His militia in particular not only attacked UN soldiers directly, but also intercepted and hijacked UN relief efforts so that this apocalyptic famine would only grow worse in parts of the country that just weren't supporting his militia. Now, to be perfectly fair and honest, when the United Nations fought back against the Deeds militia, there were some careless military operations, there were some human rights abuses, so this was just a really, really bad situation that just kept getting worse. Finally came Operation Gothic Serpent, which the United States set up separate from direct UN involvement. These guys would be reporting through Joint Special Operations Command and CENTCOM. Gothic Serpent was largely built around Task Force Ranger under the command of Major General William F. Garrison, and their mission was to go after and neutralize the Adid militia directly, thus freeing up the United Nations for the business of humanitarian relief. Task Force Ranger went to work in late August 1993, primarily made up of Bravo Company 3rd Battalion 75th Ranger Regiment, Charlie Squadron of the 1st Special Forces Operation Detachment Delta, or Delta Force, and 1st Battalion of the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment. Well, we've all seen the movie. On 3 October 1993, Task Force Ranger had reliable intelligence that two of Adid's top lieutenants would be meeting at the Olympic Hotel. This is in the Bakara Market, deep within the militia-controlled sections of Mogadishu. The Delta operators, carried in by Little Birds, were supposed to hit the hotel itself, capture the HVTs, or high-value targets, along with any other prisoners they could find, Meanwhile, Rangers were supposed to chalk in off of MH-60 Blackhawks and establish a secure perimeter around the target building. Finally, a ground convoy, mostly made up of Humvees and 5-ton trucks, would get to the hotel, load up all of the prisoners, and get them safely out of the combat area and back to base. Well, of course, it didn't happen that way. Although the HVTs and the other prisoners were captured and safely evacuated back to the base, so technically the mission was a success, one of the supporting MH-60 Blackhawks had been shot down by a militia RPG. This crash site now became a completely unplanned new objective that the Rangers would have to secure, a new perimeter to establish, and a new evacuation that had to be executed. The Battle of Mogadishu was on, but it was going to be way more complicated than anybody had planned. Okay, everyone, here is our table. We're looking at a few blocks of the Bakara Market in downtown Mogadishu, 
We're playing in 20mm today, and we're generally looking into the northwest. Up first, we have a small group of our waiting SNA militia, along with one of their technicals that they seem to be keeping hidden from air power. Speaking of air power, we have one of our little birds overlooking the scene, and it looks like he's trying to provide overwatch for some of our forces on the ground. Speaking of ground forces, we have Lieutenant Colonel McKnight here, commander of 3rd Battalion 75th Rangers and the ground convoy. He's got a private and a PFC in that Humvee with him. And you see that Staff Sergeant there? That is Staff Sergeant Eversman. He is Chalk 4 leader of Bravo Company, 3rd Battalion. Heading over here to our Delta operators, you see the one figure that has the Delta 12 tag attached to his base. That is Sergeant First Class Norm Hooten, or who? He gets to roll a D12, so does McKnight there. They are clearly the most experienced characters on the table, so they get to roll the biggest dice. Uh, Staff Sergeant Eversman also has a D10, and so does the Corporal that runs his second fire team. Here we have a second Humvee that is crewed by a sergeant, another private in a PFC up there on the Maldus. I should say that both of the Humvees have uh, M2HB heavy machine guns. And of course, here we have our boy Abdi. Everyone knows who he is, and just in case you don't, here's a quick reminder. Now, is this supposed to be the place, or did his car just take a dump? Speaking of the place, here is our approximation of the Olympic Hotel. So the basis of our scenario is that the Olympic Hotel has just been hit, Delta has gone in and uh, captured the HVTs, and that convoy has returned to base. Then disaster strikes. We look over here to the Super 6-1 crash site, our titular Black Hawk Down. Now, between the Super 6-1 crash site and the Olympic Hotel, obviously there are going to be plenty of hostile SNA militia whose mission it is to stop the Americans from reaching the Super 6-1 crash site, or the Walcott crash site, named for Chief Warrant Officer Walcott, who was the pilot of Super 6-1. Now, once the Americans reach the crash site and at least one American unit comes in base-to-base -base contact with that crashed helicopter, that begins a dice mechanic Hopefully the Americans will roll pretty well there because once a success is made, that brings on the column of the United Nations and 10th Mountain Division. Yes, we are really compressing the timeline. We're not going to play till 02 in the morning when this convoy actually arrived. They're going to arrive here on this road, and as soon as they reach the crash site, that pretty much ends the game. Okay, let's get this game going. I'm playing the Americans, my friend Mark is playing the Somalis, and as the American regular forces player, I always have initiative. So my first action is going to be to take a rapid movement order and fire once I reach that wall into those Somalis beyond. Notice I was measuring around that building, because to get through a building, I have to take a breach, and that's another action with the hell with that. I just want to move up and open fire. So I've already measured it, I'm now moving up my figures, and before I open fire, Mark declares he wants to try a reaction with his Somali militia band leader there on the other side of that wall. So it comes down to basically who fires first. So I roll my leadership dice, I have a Corporal D10 there, he has a militia band leader there, D6. My D10 luckily beats his D6, so I get to shoot first. So I'm adding up all the dice there, my saw, my grenadier, and we'll come up with a total dice pool and see how that goes. Okay, here are the results of my first fire phase. And wow, these are his defense dice, those are really bad. Okay, only four ups ever count, so I'm gonna go ahead and remove those four dice. I'm gonna remove my one dice that failed. And now, any four ups that succeeded, the defender has to try to match against my defense dice. Well, his best defense dice was a four. You see, he can't beat any of my results. So that's gonna be four hits immediately applied against his squad. Now his fire still happens. He did declare a reaction. The problem is those four guys that were hit do not get to shoot back. This is not a simultaneous fire game. This is modern warfare. Modern warfare happens fast. Next unit to move is the Chalk 4 fire team directly with Staff Sergeant Eversman. You see Staff Sergeant 10 there on the counter? That's Eversman. I'm now in ambush radius of that Somali militia band right across the street. Mark, however, chooses not to take ambush fire. I think he's waiting for one of my Humvees to come up the road. Fair enough, that allows me to make a search check, which I succeed with a D10, and boom, that unit's no longer hidden. Now, Eversman couldn't actually fire because I had to move and search. Those were my two actions. But here comes Mr. Hoot. Hoot comes up, and Hoot has only moved. Now he fires. 
Now, Mark definitely says, I do want to take reaction fire. He doesn't have to shoot at who? He can shoot at any unit that's in line of sight. So now he's going to take some bladed fire against Staff Sergeant Eversmith. But as the Somalis are interrupting my action, I'm going to interrupt their interruption because my man Tom Sizemore, and by that I mean Lieutenant Colonel Daniel McKnight, is nearby in his Humvee and he's on Overwatch. So he's going to fire his M16 out the window while his PFC there is going to fire his Maw Deuce to help take some of the fire off of Eversman. Help! They're shooting at us! They're shooting at us! We'll shoot back! Alright, here are the dice results from my opportunity fire. These first five D8s are my 50 cal, and that's McKnight. So these first two results aren't four ups, they don't even count. Those remaining three hits are potential hits. And McKnight's a friggin' sniper, man, look at that. So here are all of Mark's defense dice. As you can see, he only gets these sixes because troop quality is a thing. He starts off with six figures, and then he gets two additional dice because he was inside a building. Alright, so again, here's where true quality really comes into play, because now Mark has to try to match his defense dice against my attack results as best he can. And with a D6, you're never going to beat a 7, much less a 12. So again, true quality is really a thing, and that's going to be two hits assessed against this unit before it gets to shoot at Eversman. Alright, that unit has shot at Eversman, uh, they missed. You see where I applied the two hits uh, from McKnight's cover fire? And now a new unit has rolled out into that alley and also opened fire into Eversman's Chalk 4 fire team. Okay, that fire team has already reacted, but they're going to have to react again or else they're just going to wind up taking casualties. So Eversman's Chalk 4 fire team was able to put up some pretty decent defensive reaction fire. You see where I knocked down two more figures out of that new Somali team, including a PK machine gunner. However, these successive reactions all taken in the same turn do degrade your unit's performance. I don't care how elite of an operator you are, there's only so much your guys can do all at once, especially at the pace of minor combat. So then I took some uh, actual Somali fire after that. I'm trying to match up my defense dice as best I could, but now I have two unanswered attack dice that I cannot match or beat with my defense dice. That means I finally took some casualties. Okay, there's five men in that unit, so I'll roll a d10 divided by two to see who they are. There's Eversman's been hit himself, and that second dice indicates a third man in the squad. That's going to be the Grenadier. Alright, so Eversman and the M203 Grenadier have now actually been hit. Luckily, there is a medic with them. We're going to have to come back during the first aid phase of the next turn to see how bad these casualties actually are. Now Mark activates another batch of his yahoos, probably smoking cot in that garage. They jump over the wall, run through this little refugee camp, and open fire on this fire team, second fire team of Chalk 4. I took a second reaction, paid the penalties for doing that, shot first, and did knock down three of his figures, but then he shoots at me with his remaining PK, rifleman, and RPG. Yeah, that was bad news, until he whiffed with everything. So, long story short, take your first shot, I just got hella lucky there. Because so far that fire team has knocked down seven Somalis, and they haven't been so much as scratched in return. Definitely some MVPs there. Over here with Eversman's team, yeah, Eversman himself has hit, along with his M203 Grenadier. We're going to see how bad that situation is. He does have a medic with him, so that's good, and... Oh, no! He's rolled out his first technical! Okay, uh, it might be time to activate Overwatch fire off our gunship here. Little Bird gunship coming in hot. Mark the target with the infrared strobes as Risking the Gym knocks over all the trees on his table. Smooth move there, Paul Bunyan. Okay, now that I'm done wrecking my table and my helicopter's in position, I am taking rocket and minigun strikes, targeting that technical. That technical has now been smoked. And the way gunships work in this game is we basically get two attacks a turn, two total turns before we run out of ammo, but they've got to kind of be in a straight line. So now I'm targeting the insurgents right behind the technical. And that roll is awful. Remember, only four ups count, so... Ugh, that was awful. You saw all the dice I had to remove out of my pool. Good thing uh, Mark rolls equally badly on his defense dice, so at least I do get two kills out of that. 
Mark is now rolling to see which two guys it's going to be in his crew. Um, it does especially matter for Somalis because they're not cross-trained with different weapons. Looks like I knocked down a rifleman and that militia crew's leader. The suffering of Chalk 4 Fire Team 1 continues as yet another fire team you can see there at your lower left. Mark has brought back through this parking lot and then opened fire into their flank through this little alleyway here. So he was targeting my saw gunner and my medic. Fortunately, he ran afoul of my man Hoot back here with his Delta operators. So they also reacted and took a shot back at the insurgents before the insurgents could fire at Eversman. I only knocked down two of them though, so that wasn't great. Fortunately, Mark rolled very bad when he was shooting back at Eversman. But Eversman's not out of the woods yet. Here comes yet another fire team. Apparently, Mark has a problem with Josh Hartnett or something, man. I don't know. He just... Eversman, you might not make it through this gun battle. He shoots again, and long story short, take your second shot. Eversman lucks out again. Okay, we are finally through turn one, starting turn two. And one of the first things you do in the turn sequence is roll on the first aid table to see just how bad all these casualties really are. So there are now three casualties with that fire team. I'm going to roll 3d6 on this table. Luckily they're all with a medic, so as you can see on your screen there, they do get a better table. First, the private. Okay, unfortunately that's a two, and on either table that's going to be a serious wound, and that's now permanent. Staff Sergeant Eversman rolls a six! Cool! That's what you get for being the star of the movie, I guess. Alright, he's okay. He's actually no wound at all. Okay, next we'll roll for his PFC, Grenadier. That's the guy with the M203 Rain Launcher. He also rolls a six. All right, so long story short, take your third shot. You'll never hear me talk trash about a combat medic again. Two of those wounds just basically don't even count, but we do have one serious wound in that fire team. Meanwhile, looking at Mark's casualties, they're much more severe. In order for them to survive being hit, they have to roll a six on a D6. This is basically the cot roll. They slap some narcotics on their wounds and hope they don't feel it anymore. I should note, all those guys aren't dead, but as insurgents, they've decided that enough is enough for one day. Then comes the uh, reinforcement phase, which Mark is much more agreeable with. And then we roll to see what unit he gets and then what hotspot they come in on. So first of all, he has to roll a D6 under the table's insurgency level. The insurgency level is insanely high in the middle of the Battle of Bogadishu. So he does get a new squad. We then roll to see which squad he gets. It was that one that was sitting right there. And then you roll a D6 to see which hotspot it appears through. There are five hotspots on a force on force table. You roll a D6. That's the hotspot that it comes in at. And if you roll a six, you get to pick what hotspot it comes in at. Meanwhile, the regular forces player, if they reach a hotspot and basically frag the spider hole, then that hotspot is now shut down, and if any insurgents arrive through that hotspot, they are considered lost units. So clearly, shutting down hotspots is a key tactic for regular forces players in your typical force-on-force -force games. Getting into the meat of turn two, the first unit I activated were the Delta operators that were there. They split their fire, they took two shots down, and down those last two insurgents in that parking lot and then the other two shots tried to provide some kind of cover fire as they bounced from their position none other than hoot himself rolled a two on his d12 so apparently he forgot to uh, pack live ammunition nevertheless with the rest of those somalis now casualties they were able to race down into that parking lot he did take a lot of small arms fire out of that building including an rpg it passed right between those two vehicles and exploded next to them. However, they did manage to uh, not take any damage from that. So that's a shot right out of the movie. When you hear that pop hiss and they're trying to run between those narrow alleyways and all you see is that big rocket coming down right at them. Hey, run! You okay? Yeah! Again, luckily I got away with it. Serious problem here, guys. You see that Humvee I drove up on the left-hand side of your screen? I moved him right past that RPG gunner on the right. I totally forgot about him. Luckily, he lost his leader in the gunship strike last turn, so he has to beat me on a reaction test in order to shoot at me before I drive by. Thank God I beat him on an 8. Otherwise, I could have lost this whole game on one die roll. That RPG will still get to shoot, but it'll have to shoot at a different target now that the Humvee has driven past. Okay, the RPG has hit Samsung Eversman's fire team. 
Now he's rolling his rifle. Okay, so those first three dice, those are the RPG. The four is the accompanying rifleman. And uh, clearly he scored three hits there. All right, four ups. So now I'm gathering up my defensive dice. I've got three D8s and a D10 for Eversman himself. Okay, there are my results. All right, so the three doesn't count. The six can beat that six. The seven beats that six. That doesn't count. And then my five beats the four. Okay, I got away with it again. Whew. Again, the real lucky break, though, was when that Humvee managed to drive past that RPG without taking an RPG right in the side. That would have been bad. I would have been 10 points for the Humvee, and then whatever casualties I took when the Humvee almost certainly blew up. Under an absolute hail of fire, Staff Sergeant Eversman's Chalk 4, Fire Team 1, has finally abandoned that position there on the corner and fallen back through the alleyway into that parking lot. They took fire from that group, they took fire from those two groups, neither of which have leaders, so actually Mark had to make troop quality checks against the D6 for them to do honestly anything at all. And then I also took fire from uh, that fourth group. So from four separate units, um, they took fire as they pulled out of there. That pickup truck has got to be absolute Swiss cheese by now. They can only move at six inches, by the way. They can only take a tactical move because they are now carrying a dependent, i.e. a seriously wounded casualty. So that's pretty much going to wrap up the American Turn 2. I do still have one fire mission on my Overwatch Little Bird gunship. So I'm going to wait now as Mark starts his turn to see where I might commit uh, that Overwatch um, oh, yeah, it might be right here, because here comes the second technical, carrying the SPG-9 recoilless rifle. Okay, that's going to be a problem. So, yeah, here's the ground view from who's already the world's luckiest Humvee. He dodged that RPG before. Now, looks like he's about to take an RPG in the teeth as he rounds that corner. So, it's time for me to activate my little bird here on Overwatch and get him into a position where he can clear the way for that Humvee. The question is, where exactly am I going to move him? Because the way these strafing attacks work, I only have one strafing attack left, is he gets to attack two units, and they both have to be in a line with the approach of the little bird. So I'm going to have to find another target and then move the little bird appropriately. So here is the SPG-9. You can see where he's taking the moving fire order. He's about to shoot right down the street at my Humvee there. So I have to, obviously I'm going to hit the technical. Okay, who else am I going to hit? Those insurgents that are in the building right behind look like a good target. I just have to get the little bird in position where he can attack both of those units in a general-ish line of attack. Here are the die results for my little bird attack. As you can see, I actually did pretty well. Good enough to rate me a D12 on the damage table, especially since Mark only rolled a 1 on defense. But then I rolled a 3. God damn it. I did so great on my chance to hit and then rolled like ass for my damage. As you can see on the 3, all I did was I knocked out half the technical's movement, which is not going to get it done at all. So then my Humvee shot back and disabled the rest of the technicals movement. It doesn't matter, it still has a gun. And yeah, it's already in the perfect position to hit me with that SPG recoilless rifle. Mark rolls, he scores a hit. He actually beats my defense roll by two dice, which means he gets a D10 on the damage roll. Okay, very bad news. Then he rolls well with an 8. Alright, so we consult 8 on the damage table. Okay, that is a brood up Humvee. Everyone in there gets to bail, and everyone has to make a casualty check at negative 1 to their troop quality. So, like say a sergeant's troop quality is 10, he rolls a D8. My PFC and my private, they used to be D8s, now they roll 6s, but they both beat a 4, so they're both okay. Now my sergeant was a 10, but he's reduced to a D8. Ugh. Okay, my sergeant is now an actual casualty. Not cool. Looking here on the scenario chart, we can see where the SNA gets 10 points just for knocking out a Humvee. With one die roll, Mark has pretty much tied the game. Alright, so the Little Bird's second strafe attack was against the insurgents in the building behind the technical. Thermal sights I can see into the building. I didn't do very much though. Either way, he is now dry on miniguns and rockets. He is going to RTB back to base to rearm. Although, in scenario terms, yeah, he's gone for the game. 
Okay, that wraps up turn two, and we now begin turn three. And like I've been saying, the turn sequence begins with the first aid phase, where we see how bad our new casualties actually are. So, yeah, our one new casualty for this turn is that sergeant who didn't make it through that Humvee explosion. He's in a bit of a tough spot. The good news is he is within the rapid move radius of the medic there that hopefully you can see in the center of your screen. So at least he'll be able to use the medic table. So come back next week and see if we're able to salvage this casualty. Well, everyone, that's where we're going to leave it for now. So far, my Rangers and Delta operators aren't doing too bad. We've managed to keep casualties down to a bare minimum, and we've made pretty good progress toward the crash site. There is some bad news, though. Our Little Bird gunship is dry on miniguns and rockets. He has to RTB back to rearm. And what this means in game terms is that we have now lost that Little Bird air support for the remainder of the scenario. In some really bad news, we've now officially lost our first Humvee, and there's a casualty in that Humvee. Just how bad of a casualty he is, well, we're going to have to wait until the first aid phase of next turn to actually find out. So what I'm saying here, guys, is please come back next week when we finish up this game and see how our recreation of Mogadishu shakes out. So, like I said, that's where we're going to leave it for now, folks. Thanks very much for watching. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed this content. Please remember to hit that notification bell. Also, please consider joining the Sidra Podcast Discord. There is an auto-accept invitation link to our Discord in the description of this video. Join our community, see what everybody is up to, and best of all, show us what's going on on your hobby table. But for now, this is the Risking the Gym with the Sit Rep Podcast. We are rounds complete for another episode. And as always, Tango Mike for watching.